I'm, uh, I'm not the raconteur that, uh, that Brian is, and I'm, I'm not as, uh, nearly as good a researcher as Bob. I first visited the wine region of the Hunter Valley in 1972, which is 50 years ago. As startling as that seems to me, but it was then. It was a very different place to what it is now. For example, if you came to a Colburn looking for a round of golf, you were certainly in the wrong place. First accommodation in the vineyard area uh, was Elfin Hill, and that was about to open. So it opened, I think, later in the latter half of 1972. And from memory, it was very hard to get into. There was a lot of demand for accommodation in the vines, and that was the only one. Uh, there are now about 150 cellar doors in the Hunter. Uh, 50 years ago, we had Drayton's, Elliot's, Lakes Folly, Lindemans, McWilliams, Roberts Belbury, Tullock's, Tyrrell's, Happy Valley and Wyndham Estate. Now, um, uh, that really only makes eight because you, uh, because Elliot's didn't actually have a cellar door as such, they had a shop in Cessnock. And, and Lakes Folly, well, <laughs> Technically, it was a cellar door, but there was a permanent sign on the gate saying that all the wine was sold and to come back next year. <laughs> a bit of Max's humour. Um, uh, the Rothbury Estate was about to open a rather grand premises on Broke Road. And, uh, and that, uh, really, there was a, a, a golden era of the Rothbury Estate that had a profound influence on the Hunter Valley and me, and I'll get around to that shortly. In this area here, the Hermitage Road, around Hermitage, uh, there wasn't really a lot uh, at that point. Uh, Tyrrell's marked the western, western extremity for winery visits. However, there were some significant vineyards around this, this part of the Hunter and, and some quite historic ones. Belford Vineyard, uh, now owned by Tyrrell's, was planted by the Elliott family in 1933. Uh, the Rothbury Estate had Homestead Hill Vineyard. Uh, Penfolds owned the Hunter Valley Distillery Vineyard on Hermitage Road, which was planted in 1903 and later became Tyrrell's HVD. Uh, Hermitage Estate Winery was under construction. That's on, on this property here. And uh, to handle uh, the fruit that was, was, uh, was being grown in this part of the, uh, this part of the Hunter a mistletoe farm, which was already mentioned. And Quentin Tapperell was planting Quentin Estate on, on Deasy's Road. This later became Marsh Estate. Uh, as a matter of interest, uh, one of the really famous vineyards around here now is Braymore, and the oldest vines on that vineyard in 1972 were just three years old. I... Uh, really developed my connection with the Hunter Valley through the, uh, with the help of Len Evans at the Rothbury Estate. And uh, 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 Len seemed to see a bit of potential in me and, uh, and was always encouraging. Uh, he introduced me to Murray Tyrrell and uh, those two uh, fellows had a profound, a profound effect on my life. Um, and I hope in the annals of the Hunter, they're never forgotten. They, uh, they were the, are the same to a lot of other people. They were, they were uh, real guiding hands and uh, uh, very dominant personalities. I, uh, I didn't get off to a really good start with Murray. Um, I was invited uh, as a young fellow, I, I wouldn't have even been 30, uh, I was invited by Murray into the lab in the winery. Well, this was a big event, and uh, I, uh, he lined up some glasses of wine and said, OK, tell me about them. So I was full of confidence and uh, uh, waffled on for a while, and he looked at me with his steely blue eyes and said, you're an effing young upstart who doesn't know what he's talking about. That was a wonderful start. It, it set me back a peg or two. It made me a little bit more humble. But uh, about three or four weeks later, 
and made the six and a half hour drive up from Canberra again, fronted up at Tyrrell's. He took one look at me and said, what, uh, are you here again? Uh, but somehow we got through it and he became a good friend and uh, was really kind to my wife Adrian and I for the rest of his life. Um, uh, by the uh, 70s, things were starting to, to happen in the wine industry in the Hunter Valley. Australians had discovered wine. Uh, the era of the dinner party was in full swing. And the commercial development of Hunter, of Hunter Valley wine uh, commenced in the seven. Uh, commenced to rise in the 70s and continues still. It uh, just hasn't stopped. Yeah, the, the establishment of the Hunter Valley, as, um, as, as the two preceding speakers have uh, pointed out, started, started much earlier than 1972. Uh, one of the key figures um, was Maurice O'Shea. And he uh, studied winemaking at Montpellier University. And in 1917, he studied at the Institut National Agronomique Paris-Grignon, uh, where he studied viticulture and enology. In 1921, he bought Mount View Vineyard and two adjoining blocks, uh, and he renamed the property Mount Pleasant. He then planted Old Paddock Vineyard, and in the following three decades, he etched his name in Australian winemaking history. I've had the enormous pleasure of tasting at least a dozen of his red wines, and the best of them rank with the world's finest. O'Shea's uh, love and knowledge of European wines influenced him strongly, and I believe we can thank him uh, for, the, for the Hunter Valley medium-bodied style of uh, red wine. Uh, the vast majority of Hunter Reds uh, these days fall into that medium-bodied style, and that's and that's a very important thing. Um, to, uh, to me, the uh, Hunter Red at its best is a very accessible, drinkable wine when it's young. And uh, that uh, those uh, medium-bodied Shiraz wines in particular uh, are a style that uh, are absolutely unique. Uh, uh, when you taste them with other wines, they stand out as very much as Hunter Wines, and that's uh, one thing that's very important, that identity, the regional identity. And um, uh, we've got some, some brilliant winemakers in this region um, who are really producing outstanding wine, and uh, uh, people like Andrew Spinazzi and Mark uh, Richardson at Tyrrell's, Stuart Horden at Brokenwood, uh, 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 Mike Julius and Andrew Thomas who are in this room with us, uh, Liz Silkman at First Creek, uh, Adrian Sparks at Mount Pleasant, uh, that's just a few, and, uh, but they're all uh, doing the Hunter proud. And, and getting back to the Hunter Red style, uh, uh, that's uh, the essential key is that medium bodiness, that, uh, that, uh, that elegance if you like, it's a vague word I know, and although it's a warm region, um, the Hunter doesn't normally produce any hot, jammy reds. Um, I guess a part of that would be afternoon shading from the ranges, and as, uh, and as Bob Lusby said, um, you, uh, you do get that maritime influence, the sea breeze, uh, cooling things down overnight. And uh, occasionally I even see Hunter red up, but getting up around 15% alcohol, but it still doesn't taste heavy. And it's an interesting thing. But I feel that uh, the future uh, a success of the region is strongly linked to maintaining a focus on that style. They're all good to drink young, but also have the capacity to age. And that's another thing. You can have it each way with, with that style of wine. Um, the, uh, the medium-bodied nature of the wine makes it easy to drink, but, but the balance and length of flavour uh, allow you to cellar it pretty much for as long as you want. After spending six months in Europe in, in 1981, I became a firm fan of that savoury style of red that didn't rely on brute force. 
Uh, but there was an event uh, shortly after where I had that really flash of light moment with Hunter Shiraz. And uh, some, uh, sometime in the 80s, uh, my wife Adrian and I rented self-contained accommodation not far from here. And I bravely invited Murray Tyrrell to a dinner that I was to prepare. I think that evening sealed a friendship with, the, with that tough, outspoken bloke. He used to refer to people who didn't understand good wine and food as barbarians. I proved to him that I wasn't one. Uh, but my, my, uh, my longest lasting memory that evening was the lesson he taught me. He brought along two wines, uh, uh, both 20-year-old reds. Uh, one was a Tyrrell Shiraz and the other was a Gevry Chambertin from Burgundy. Uh, the wines were so similar, I was astounded. Uh, how could a 20-year-old Hunter Shiraz be so similar to a 20-year-old Pinot Noir from France? I can still hear Murray chuckling. Uh, the essence of it is, uh, that once again, that medium-bodied flavour, uh, gentle tannins and the maturity of those two wines. Uh, by the time Murray was in his 30s, he'd already learned from O'Shea and it showed in his approach to winemaking. Uh, uh, recently, I had the opportunity on, a, on another visit up here, only a month or so ago, uh, to taste red wines from uh, 2009 and 2019 vintages uh, from several different wineries. Uh, there were definite echoes of O'Shea in the 2019s, in my opinion. We're we getting to a point that Morris O'Shea had reached over 90, uh, about 90 years ago. So it's interesting um, how things go around and come around. The, uh, uh, the great wines of the Hunter Valley uh, were made uh, by Mount Pleasant, Tyrrells and Lindemans in the 1930 to 1970 period. Uh, the 30 years that followed weren't really great ones. Um, a, a high demand uh, for wine put pressure on winemaking facilities all over Australia, and uh, faulty wines were more common than they should have been. Uh, now that applied to Australia as a whole. As I said, I, uh, I'm not just singling out the hunter here, but, but the hunter was part of it. And uh, uh, coming into the 90s, and the 2000s, Andrew Spinozzi from Tyrrells played a big role in leading the hunter out of uh, what you call a Britannomyces era, uh, where sweaty saddle was considered by many to be a positive descriptor. I'm guessing Maurice O'Shea used relatively high levels of sulphur when he made uh, sulphur dioxide when he made his wines to suppress Brett. Uh, but in the 90s and early 2000s, as the trend towards big alcohol a big alcoholic reds uh, uh, took over in South Australia, uh, um, fueled by uh, a well-known American commentator, Robert Parker. Um, this was a, a pretty grim time for me to be a wine critic. Um, uh, the combination of overripeness and oakiness resulted in many ugly wines, and, uh, and wines that were lavishly uh, praised by some, uh, some wine critics, but not this one. Uh, uh, the rise of those over-the-top South Australian reds coincided uh, with a return to normality in the Hunter Valley. In other words, we were getting back to uh, the style of wines that, uh, uh, that O'Shea and, uh, and Carl Stockhausen at Lindemans um, made. And, um, and to me, that was a great thing. The, um, so what are the Hunter's, Hunter's great red wines today? Um, uh, there are quite a few, but most of them come from the vineyards uh, that produced great wine 70 and more years ago. Uh, Tyrrells have some wonderful old vineyards, including four acres uh, from which O'Shea made the 54 Mount Pleasant Richard, and Old Patch, which was a source of some magnificent Lindemann's wines in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Mount Pleasant is home to the vineyards planted by O'Shea, and Adrian Sparks is maintaining that legacy. A broken wood has to be included for the graveyard Shiraz. And, uh, and again, our, our friends Mike Delius and Andrew Thomas are crafting some brilliant wines. Uh, that's not a complete list either. But, but what makes 
those wines so good, those, those great hunter wines. And uh, I suppose we, we have to bring up the much abused word terroir, uh, overused and very abused, that the when you develop an enthusiasm for wine in your earliest days, you learn uh, that the same grape variety uh, grown on different sites produces different wine. Uh, to that extent, terroir exists. All the classic wines I've mentioned are grown on different soil types. So there's no such thing as hunter terroir because terroir is tied to specific sites. But what is it really? It's a complex concept far more complex than the basic French version that maintains that the flavour of the grape is directly related to the chemical makeup of the soil on which the grapes are grown. The other view, uh, that view has never been scientifically established and I doubt if it ever will be. Uh, here's my take on a few things that influence terroir and therefore uh, grape flavour and wine quality. Uh, one, quite appropriately on a day like today, is drainage and uh, vines like free draining soils that don't respond well to continual dampness. Uh, Semillon in particular are uh, like sandy soils and, and, that, and that type of soil is, is associated uh, with a network of, of creeks that run through the wine area of the Hunter Valley and they're all very full at the moment. Uh, there's, uh, there's aspect, in other words, uh, uh, what direction uh, uh, the vines face. Exposure to sunlight and UV have a major effect on grape flavour and even minor changes can have an impact. Weather, yeah, right, and uh, obviously prevailing weather. Uh, that's all tied up with the concept of terroir and, uh, and also local, uh, localised events, uh, heat and un Timely rain can cause problems for, for winemakers everywhere, and they certainly do at times in the Hunter Valley. Another interesting one um, is, is vineyard microorganisms, uh, yeast and bacteria, to name but two. I suspect that's a field we'll hear a lot more about. Um, I remember a discussion with um, a, a very famous French winemaker who maintained uh, that it's in, uh, that it's impossible to talk about terroir and claim terroir effect if you don't use the indigenous, uh, the indigenous yeasts from the vineyard. It's a very interesting concept. Um, typically, uh, uh, particularly when I was getting interested in wine and, and learning about it, Australian winemakers would, would do their best to eliminate the indigenous yeast and introduce a cultured yeast because they knew how the cultured yeast performed. They wouldn't uh, be facing the risk of a stuck ferment, for example, and they, and they wouldn't be getting any uh, uh, poor odours, uh, H2S, whatever. But as time's gone by, there's certainly been a move to, uh, towards just uh, using the indigenous yeast. Um, and of course, there's the human influence, uh, you know, general vineyard management and, and vine pruning and so on. But um, so what does that mean for the area around here, around Hermitage? I'm afraid I can't, I can't tell, it, uh, I tell you that there is a, a, uh, there is a Hermitage Road terroir because every plot, every vineyard is different. So, but, but I see that as a positive, um, that imagine every uh, wine producer around here uh, just making a, a very similar wines out of, say, Semillon and Shiraz. Uh, I think uh, difference is a key factor. It's a key factor also in helping you with, with wine sales, that uh, people can come to this part of the Hunter and see a lot of different styles of wine made from different grape varieties. Uh, so far I've only covered Shiraz and really, but I, I really have to say something about Semillon and uh, this region produces the best dry Semillons in the world and I 
say that without any doubts at all. But um, as a young wine in particular, its dryness and fairly obvious acidity and light aromatics are very challenging for beginners. Um, as it ages, um, a, a, a semion can be a, a, can be a thing of beauty, but a lot of consumers don't like aged white wine. So, so there's a bit of a problem there in the, in the marketplace for semion. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, some hunter makers have seen the light, actually, and have included uh, what I would call a user-friendly semion in their range. And, uh, and, and that's one where low-level sweetness is used to fill out the palate and, and uh, balance the acidity. Uh, it certainly doesn't have to be a sweet wine. It can still be entered in the dry white classes at the Hunter Valley Wine Show, say six or seven grams or, or even less of sugar, which, which to most people is, is imperceptible. Um, a good palate can pick it, but the whole thing is the wine is rounder and easier to drink. I, um, uh, purists will resist that approach and I can remember at one Hunter wine show I was asked uh, to remove the sentence uh, that said some wine showed skillful use of residual sugar uh, from my class notes because the, um, the show organisers didn't want it to be seen that some people were making slightly sweeter semolon than normal. And anyway, that's something that, uh, uh, that you can think of as winemakers. Uh, Chardonnay has proved the doubt is wrong. It's successful in the Hunter as it has been in most places in Australia. And I don't think um, unwooded versions are in any way exciting. The barrel fermentation is the way to go. And, um, and that's generally what's happening. Um, the other grape varieties in the Hunter Valley and some People are actually putting a lot of work into that, and uh, I'd, I'd make a few guesses as to um, as to what may work and what may not. But um, uh, when you think that um, Chardonnay started from virtually nothing in Australia, and uh, and in 1980 I went to great lengths to organise a tasting of every Chardonnay available in Australia. I collected fewer than 20 wines. You know, think about that the way Chardonnay is now, it's everywhere. And, uh, and that's only taken 40 years. So uh, who knows, something like Fiano, uh, Fiano could take off in the Hunter Valley. It's, uh, it, it's gaining a following uh, in other parts of Australia and, and versions I've seen from here uh, look pretty promising. Um, Alberino, maybe. Uh, I even had Pecorino mentioned to me earlier today, uh, one I hadn't really thought of. But uh, Vermentino. I, Vermentino, yeah. Uh, 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 one step on from Sultana, I reckon. <laughs> um, it's better than Sultana in that it retains acidity and actually has a bit of flavour. <laughs> but Maybe a lot of people like that wine. They like uh, our Pinot Gris, after all, so uh, why not Vermentino? But uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't do a lot for me. I've, I've mentioned Mike Dulius a couple of times, and um, uh, he's on a winner with that Shiraz Tariga uh, wine of his, and it made me think about Tariga in the region. Um, a very perfumed, a very perfumed variety, and... Blended with Shiraz, it, it gives um, a, wine of, a wine a real floral overtone that Shiraz on its own doesn't have. And uh, uh, that's something to think about. I think it could be a better blending partner for Shiraz than either Pinot Noir or Viognia. And uh, the, uh, uh, that's just, uh, just another step people can take. Uh, I think it's very important to embrace difference and change in any field you're in and, 
and in wine making and wine marketing, that's vitally important. So uh, I think uh, uh, the Around Hermitage group should be very keen to embrace difference, try different grape varieties, uh, maybe different wine making techniques, um, but um, and uh, one thing I would say, I heard the word I heard the word benchmarking uh, used a bit earlier. I think it's very very important for winemakers to to benchmark their wines against others, not just their neighbours, but but wines from all over the country and even from overseas, and do it in blind tasting so they haven't. Uh, they have no idea what's in front of them, except that their own wine's in there somewhere. And uh, it can be a very humbling experience. I've, uh, I've participated in a few and organised a few of those events, and uh, it's, it certainly does uh, uh, lift the quality over time as people see their wines in a different perspective. So put your own stamp on your wine and dare to be different. Uh, uh, Richard Friend from Bella Bula is a, is a good example. He was one of the brave souls who travelled with me to Spain and Italy. It was a, uh, that was nearly 25 years ago. On returning to Australia, he planted Nebbiolo, uh, Sangiovese and Tempranillo. Perhaps the visit to Vega, Sicilia was the clincher for Tempranillo. But I wasn't confident about the Nebbiolo, but I tasted it a few days... Uh, tasted the 2014 a few days ago and was mightily impressed. So. Uh, that's just a few, uh, a few disconnected thoughts, a little bit of history, and, uh, and I'm glad, uh, I hope I didn't bore you too much. Thank you.